Doch, ja. The format this is going to be open um, I'm going to say a few words basically just to building on from what I just said earlier. Um, anyone at any point feel free just to show your hand up and to ask um, how to clarification or anything. Um, if I'm, if I'm going on then let me know. Um, and then the kind of just to open it up for discussion. Um, the idea of framing the workshop this way is that I think because the challenge is so enormous in terms of what we need to bring about, I think it, it takes up so much of our time and energy to work out how we can kind of take next steps from where we are and you know build the link with another group, etc. But um, we don't have anything like a, a kind of the scale of the, of the plan to really kind of shift things in you know in the, the time that we've got available, which is not very much, that kind of corresponds to the fairly coordinated assault that we're getting from the one percent. Um, you know, there's, there's a great quote from, from Adam Smith, in fact, which is that I, I won't get it exactly right, but it's something like, you know, um, never, never do the, the owners get together, even for I mean, whatever the equivalent of the coffee was back then, without conspiring as to how they're going to get more, more power than they had before. You know, so it, it's in the nature of the power system that it works to try and make sure that it maintains its current control. Um, and because there were central threats, but I suppose to, to tackle central threats is to try and get even more time of control. Um, and obviously it's a very rational thing if you're a modern corporation, strike very rich individual, to invest time, money, and influence in trying to make sure that the, the political rules of the game and the economic rules of the game, but most importantly, um, are arranged in your favour. It's also obviously in your interest to make sure that, that any kind of international attempt to really try and get a handle on these problems and bring about the kind of transformation that, that we all recognise needs to happen, to try and make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so what we're seeing in the UN national proceed process, um, we think that's going to do a supposedly binding international legal commitment on behalf of rich countries saying that you know, we recognise the climate change in 2000 based on historical responsibility, so that's pretty much the rich countries that can use that for carbon sinks, um, and based also on ability to pay. You know, so in theory, we already have the architecture that says the wealthy need to be fronting for new technology, um, A, stopping burning their own stuff, and fronting for new technology support because So the very idea that we kind of force into the idea that you can kind of offset, offset coal fired power stations here by saying that you know, somebody somewhere else is going to burn less missing the point that we should at a very minimum be doing both, not to mention the fact that a lot of those offsets are completely fantastical. Um, it's, it's a very creative initiative. If anyone wants to get a bit geeky on this, um, the group called Corner House that did a big report into carbon trading. And it's basically it's all about creativity. Like if you can come up with a story that you can sell to investors that says some carbon is not going to be produced because it's something done, then you know you can get credit for it. You know, so Loving company, we were going to shut down this bit of forest, but you know, if you give us the money, we won't. And in you know, fact, we might just uh, use the money to buy some bigger loving equipment and go and shut down another bit of forest. You know. um, so, we are in this sort of insane situation where we've lost 20 years of the change that we should have been bringing about, um, essentially, kind of waiting for the powerful to, to follow through on, on their commitments. And I imagine most people in this room. Um, if they you know, come through power shifts, they come through it, they will come into a frame that understands that these are not you know, primarily in a sense environmental problems, these are economic and political problems. Um, uh, one of the studies I read a book called Mindful Politics, which I'd recommend to anybody who's of a sort of vaguely spiritual bent, but it's basically done by say by good people like the Dalai Lama and Sukhan Khan and Bell Hook, which is a very inspiring um, black man writer in America. Um, but one of, one of those pieces talks about you know, how the, um, the Buddhist Four Noble Truths can be quite a kind of useful way of chatting through a lot of things. And they basically the Four Noble Truths say, you know, what, what's the problem? Where is it coming from? What's the solution? How do we get there? And those sort of four bits uh, are often quite important in terms of how we think about where we need to get to. Um, and as I was saying at the beginning, I think that the problem that we don't perhaps tackle is how we can go from being this very pluralized movement across the world with, you know, it's called the movement of movements, and it, it, it's very inspiring when you look at the movement of movements, and, um, you know, there's over a million organizations set up, you know, directed roughly in the same way as the 
problem, but what we all know is that at the moment that, that movement, movement is not a sufficiently powerful unified force to really shift 40 trillion of dollars worth of, of fossil fuel interest. And as I was saying earlier, it's very important to remember we're not just talking about fossil fuel companies, we're talking about the banks that are uh, above them that have this enormous influence over the, the entire political economy. And that wasn't clear to anybody before the economic crisis, and it should be now. You know, we are at the moment utterly kind of held to ransom by economic forces. Um, so it seems that the only thing that could give us a chance of really changing things is creating a movement that has something like a critical mass to change. And as most of you know, what I mean by critical mass is sort of that you know, mis sort of mystical point at which a movement that seems sort of impossible seems not to be winning suddenly gets to that kind of pushing point where what was impossible becomes inevitable. Um, and as I was saying also uh, earlier, it's often a relatively small percentage of people, and I think. And, you know, again, to repeat, the reason for that is that everybody deep down doesn't want to destroy the world for their children, wants to participate in a more equal world, wants some level of kind of security, that want to see the people around them getting screwed, etc. So once you can take something from being kind of fringe and others and kind of scary and, and force it onto the onto the agenda so that people see it as kind of normal and possible, then you get this real kind of snowballing. Um, and so it seems the real challenge is how to take this kind of incredible power that we have in the modern age with, with the internet and this incredible kind of, from one angle, very inspiring plurality that we have, um, how to work out a way to kind of find some kind of unified voice. And what you saw with the Occupy movement was something that, that at least for a short time, managed to kind of concentrate people's attention to the point where a fairly sort of basic case about the nature of the problem could be understood, but it was about the 1%, it was about you know, finance, it was about essentially an enormous lack of democracy. Um, but the much more difficult task is to go from being a movement that makes a sort of successful its general critique that changes the conversation, which is what I think I'll try to achieve, um, to being a movement that actually has a, a, a solution. And, and a set of solutions that people can really organise around and that are sufficiently detailed, if you like, to answer the, the sort of criticism that, well, you know, what, what's the solution actually in detail? You know, you talk generally, but, you know, what do you really do? You know, so we need that level of answer, but we also need something that is simple enough that can actually be communicated, you know, in, in, a, normal, in a normal social context to people in countries like this one, often that have been kind of propagandized for many decades and are, are kept increasingly busy. And that's the point worth, just a little aside, but I think it's a point worth making. There was a trilateral commission report in the early 70s um, that looked at, you know, at the time of sort of massive democratic experiment across the Western world. And among other things, the conclusion of that report was that people had too much democracy. You know, people had decent jobs, they were kind of unionized, um, they had relatively cheap stable housing, etc. They had too much of a platform to be, to be fighting to improve things. So to see disaster capitalism sort of neoliberalism and disaster capitalism as a very successful endeavour to make sure that people are in fact struggling more and more and have less and less time, you know, and in addition have more and more distractions, so that they are kind of much more divide divide and divide and rootable, if you like. And um, that's a, a, a historical process that we need to kind of be very realistic about. Um, the demise of political parties and union membership, um, the membership of political parties and unions, but for all the sort of good things that that implies in terms of you know not being in these sort of massively hierarchical structures, etc. The, the terrible sort of shadow side to that in terms of where we're at is that we don't have any kind of unified millions of people that can be kind of coordinated from the top down. You know. So our challenge is an enormous one to work out how to kind of replicate that capacity to create a, a that kind of international leverage that we saw in the post-war period, which is a very sort of unique time, um, when you know in this country we you know, nationalised the energy, we created the health service, we um, you know, nationalised all sorts of things, um, and at a time where we were in a historic amount of debt, um, and that created what the French called the the, the, um, the Comte Lauriers, you know, the thirty glorious years, the, the golden age of capitalism, so-called, and the golden age of democracy, so-called. Um, where things were, you know, in, in a very historically anomalous way, there was real distribution of wealth away from the super powerful. And, you know, yes, we didn't really tackle the, the structures of power kind of behind that. So, you know, neoliberalism happened and they kind of got a lot of power back. 
but nonetheless, I think we need to recognize the things from the past that are important to be able to, to try and replicate in terms of going forward. Um, so, yeah. Can I show an idea? Please show an idea. Um, when I did one of the um, mentors, we met in the 1960s, so I met with this group of brown trout. They might not want to get directly involved, but we could hook them up, give them that. Um, so I've been doing quite a lot. So let me, let me sort of put in a couple of minutes, I guess, trying to sort of paint a sort of insanely ambitious picture just so that we're kind of dreaming as big as, as we need to. And, you know, sort of thinking of what Asa said earlier about pragmatism, so called pragmatism, and what he was, I think, very rightly critiquing, is for the reasons that he made clear. Was everyone there when Asa was talking earlier about pragmatism? Yeah, for the reasons that, that he was explaining, so called pragmatism is entirely unpragmatic. So it just doesn't actually get you, it doesn't do what the right does really successfully, which is kind of ask for, that, for, ask for absolutely everything, ask for complete transformation, and through the kind of push that that creates, win this, this, and this, and this along the way. Um, and so it's about really kind of streaming B. And I think it's also about harnessing the incredible power of the internet, which is you know, powerful in all sorts of wrong ways as well, um, to communicate with each other and to build some kind of collective movement. The idea of a process pyramid is to throw that out there. Um, is about trying to get a, a, a set of solutions, which don't need to be definitive by any means at all, in a sense, the, the one of the most powerful things that we have at the moment is that the story of how crap the current system is is there for all to see. Compared to, you know, if anyone was sort of access prior to the economic crisis, it was a trickier argument to make. But the legitimacy of the system as it is is virtually zero. All that they're relying on is the idea well, there's no alternative is there. Um, so by getting a, a movement together that is working around a sensible set of solutions, and you know, so many good ideas that are obviously infinitely better than what's happening than what's happening at the moment, and we benefit the vast majority of people. Getting a movement together around a set of solutions, something like a radical Green New Deal being the centerpiece of that, and that's why this moment is so relevant here, um, I think has to be the baseline for that movement. Um, and as Occupy did um, initially, occupying public spaces that are very difficult to ignore, and doing it in a coordinated way so that people have a sense of being part of something much bigger, is an important part of this as well. But, but like I was saying, the bit that we can miss out is the question of how we might go from doing something pretty cool that makes a bit of a difference to, to actually creating a movement that has meaningful leaders in terms of really changing things. Um, and it seems the critical mass of people is crucial for that. So the idea of the process pyramid would be having days of action following on from the, uh, an occupation of Parliament Square for a week, where you really choreograph the space and use it to really um, express these solutions in a really sort of inspiring, digestible way, and, and have a website that makes it really, really easy for people to access this stuff. Um, one idea that, that we're quite keen on is that every issue has a sort of small, medium, and large attached to it. So, you know, housing, what's the solution? A one-paragraph version, a one-page version, and then, say, you know, a ten-page version that links to lots of other documents so that we answer the critique that we know what's the real detail. We can just bring in all the, all the work that's already been done, you know, thousands of social scientists, all sorts of experts having to do good work. The only point is that the only problem is they don't have any sort of inputs behind that work. Um, you can video as well, this is a really good idea. So similarly, you can have small, medium, and large on the climate, you know, three minute version of, you know, what's going wrong and, and what we can do about it, um, you know, 10 minute version, etc. So just make that, that informational resource really accessible. But the idea of the process pyramid is trying to give everybody who's interested in this a, a way to get involved that's as easy as possible. Um, so I think a lot of people, it summed up in the meeting I went to a few weeks ago, which I just said, um, you know, in a sense, the most exclusive kind of a movement is one where you occupy public spaces and say, join us. You know, for a lot of people, that's not something that they feel ready to do. So the idea would be, you know, if you just want to hand out leaflets outside of the bank or in your local high street about what's going on, what the problem is, as long as you take a picture of that and send it to the website, that's half your job done. The other half is to make sure for the next day of action the following week, you get one other person to do something with you. And, and the basic idea is here is using the insanity of the exponential function, which has been used in, in terms of the, you know, the craziness of, of having an infinite growth economic system on a finite planet, using that insanity against the system. You know, so if you can get each person to try and get two people each week to try and sort of 
cover your bases. It's that you can get one person each week, you can go from 2,000 people, that if we do the camp well, it should be you know, the minimum we can get involved the first time, you can go from 2,000 people to 4 million people in 11 days of action. You know. <laughs> um, and, there's no, and there's no reason, there's no reason you can't do that. You know. And if you, like me, spend, spend your life talking to people that get this better in principle, but there's no alternative is there, so there's no point in getting involved, the idea is you know, to, to really share this as the possibility of a really exciting experiment to, to try and create the world that we all know we need to see. Um, and obviously if you can get simultaneous things happening in different places, I think there is this huge amount of evidence that there are these sort of dormant critical masses in terms of people that believe in the change. Um, it's just we've been turned into sort of individual consumers that don't feel we can make a difference. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, the, the basic vision of, of a way that we could try and create a critical mass that has both a mechanism for how you get to millions of people involved from not enough. Um, in fact, at the moment, it's lots of people involved are just involved in ways that aren't part of the sort of shared story. So in many cases, it's just a question of getting people who are already doing stuff to kind of pull their efforts. Um, but so that's a way that we, could, that we could go about trying to go from knowing enough people to enough people involved. That obviously is phase one, and um, we probably don't have time here to, to discuss how you would lever that, that massive support into political change, but obviously um, you know, ha articulating with available political alternatives, you know, for trying to force you know, the Labour Party, for instance, to take that on. Or, I mean, if, if, put it this way, if we had four million people taking action around an inspiring vision, that would be a very, very different political playing field to which the powers that be would have to respond. Um, you know, the Green Party had the same policies with the website for both the policies, where people um, vote for the policies without knowing which party they're from, and invariably people vote, people vote for the Green Party like more, more than any other. Um, and using um, opinion poll data really at the forefront of this movement would be a really good way to, to make the case that it's democratically legitimate, getting lots of different groups to descend on Parliament is the idea. So, so people that already have been working in their communities that do have that grassroots um, integrity and credibility. Um, but I definitely talked about time, so let's let's um, open this open this up to discussion. And and obviously, you know, totally can throw it down and add anything you want to on any level, but I'd love to, to have a discussion now. What what I think when you think of a mess is, is there is there is a lot of people that are kind of on it individually. Like it's a completely like it's not no one in that problem. Stranger danger kind of people feel a victim of the system but don't really don't aren't part of the collective. There's like a lot of that. But there's also a lot of people who are involved. I think there's lots of movements uh, from the different labels that are actually trying to sort of have a more democratic society, more social, more just society, um, and a more green society. And I think the people who are in <coughs> at the top levels of those organizations, like sort of Abaz and 350 and uh, change.org and all these people who have like lots of <coughs> big followers. I think what would be great is if they started collaborating with each other. If they started really getting in contact with each other and being a sort of, oh, hey, you guys, you've got a big collective of people who are actually socially aware. I'll still give you. <coughs> let's get together and like, let's, let's, or even in sort of like a, a demonstration together, like a combination of different groups. And that could start even spreading it even more. And then that's, it, it, the more it, it becomes a, a bigger movement, the more hard it is to ignore from, from media sources. I mean, I was talking to Anne Pesper about this, and she was the woman behind the Give Me Debt campaign, where it's many people. And she said, you know, the experience of that movement is that once you create something that starts working, people get involved, you know. And so that's, that's really, I, I think, <coughs> the, the challenge is to create a vessel that could operate as a kind of echo chamber as a sort of amplifier to the many voices that are already out there that we don't, in a sense, need to sort of build a movement from the, from the ground up. We need to create a mechanism for the sort of millions of bits that are already there to come together effectively. And it's, it's really about, and the, the, there's a subtitle that we always text that talks about relations of definition. And again, I always talk about Naomi Klein, so excuse me, that's a good example. Um, but the, the, the picture that she gives in our logo, I think it's very, very important in terms of how the power system has moved to kind of informational control and branding instead of actually controlling, you know, actually owning stuff. You know, so, um, so, so it prevents striking workers from being problematic. If you're a giant corporation, you just have a three-month subcontract with the factory in Indonesia, and if the workers start going up to you, then fine, you get to find it out, etc. Um, so it's about recognizing the huge power that, that the 1% has to write the story of what reality is, and to 
with this idea of trying to be really realistic about how difficult it is to break into that. But one of the huge Achilles heels of the system in countries like this one. You got 15 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. one, of the, um, one of the huge Achilles heels of the system in, in countries like this one is that the, the system can only work as long as people think the press is free. So when you do things that aren't ignorable, where obviously it would be absurd for them not to cover it, um, then they have to. And the idea of the liberal media is important here as well, because most journalists actually, on a personal level, they're more liberal than the average, because it's a fundamental part of liberalism that you want to hold power for account, etc. So it's, it's, it's about levering that situation to really just force something through that kind of internet-based noise, if you like. Mm -hmm. so. So divestment? Divestment is removing investment from fossil fuels. You can divest anything that you think is unethical. Okay. Uh, fossil free use, for instance, is one that you can do. Um, yeah, there's actually a, uh, somebody, Simon, was actually saying that he wants, um, trying to get a group in, um, hankering back to the, um, was it Committee 100, so <coughs> they are willing to actually get arrested, uh, just sitting down somewhere, get arrested, go to prison and refuse to be de-arrested. <laughs> and actually go to court and then so on and so forth and hopefully get uh, a thousand people in. That's actually what we found in, uh, well, it's student uh, protests, I suppose. People get arrested, they get to, um, they end up in a bus and then de-arrested at some point or taken to a, taken to a, a police station, be released at about, um, at about three o'clock in the morning and then three months later the uh, the charges are dropped. But then it was pointed out to me, like what's happening now in Barton Moss with the people who arrested, do not, okay, uh, if they actually uh, drop the charges, take them to court. Because at this moment in time, that's actually the only thing that's, that I would actually teach them a lesson, or the police a lesson, that if you do get arrested, they know that they will t they w you will be taken to court afterwards.
Um, so I think those things are really important. It's getting, like you said, it's getting the community leaders to have a place. Is anyone here from platform? Does anyone here work for platform? We're, we're working on an initiative with them as well um, where we're going to create an online um, advocacy kind of training, and it'll be free. Um, and it's for people that are resisting oil development specifically. Um, so there's going to be a lot of legal stuff on there. Um, yeah, so I think that that kind of stuff, um, seeing it pop up more, is really, really important. And, and the democracy on the level of one to coincide with the Wu-Tang Power thing that we were hearing about this morning, which again is an attempt to bring together all these grassroots movements actually struggling against this stuff on the front lines. Because that's how to get that bridge between the, the grassroots and the local and the macro, which is being you know, driven from places like the city of London, that it has that has this huge power over what's going on at the grassroots, how to go from being defensive movements to being on, on the front foot. Um, make a point here and then we um, um, <laughs> Question. Um, because obviously, when um, massive revolutions have actually taken place through involving the masses, I mean, you look at the Egyptian revolution that happened by Twitter, or you look at Ukraine, whatever's going on over there right now, um, where using the masses has actually made a difference. But I guess my question is where the masses are not involved, do you think it's more productive to have? to show that you're already making a difference through the practical efforts, as opposed to being a minority who's standing for something that not a lot of people are going to be paying as much attention to. In the, in the UK, there's a situation where there's a lot of, what, what I'm thinking about with this movie is not as opposed to all the great things happening at the moment, is that there are huge numbers of, of you know, community-based things, NGOs that are kind of doing all this really good work, kind of engaging with people on, on the ground in terms of their daily needs. Just a question of trying to create something that would allow all those efforts to kind of articulate with some kind of coordinated leverage at the, at the top. And, yeah, um, and coming at the hierarchy thing, yeah, I think that having people in accountable positions of relative responsibility and having systems where people, you know, in the movement can, you know, have means to, to you know, sort of remove those people if they're not, you know, doing a job that you feel is, is sort of representative. I think it's a really important about getting beyond the idea of you know, the hierarchy being, you know, certain people being some, sometimes even better, more worthy, more important because they have a certain position of responsibility. Um, and that is an important shift, I think, you know, um, from what I make at the moment. What, where can we go next with this? Where's the next step? Are we going to be trying to, trying to meet up again? Because I think we, we just need to kind of make, everyone's actually active, everyone who actually wants to see change. We want to see maybe in like even like six months the meet up to say, okay, well how's everyone getting on? Where are we going with this? Like what what's the next step? How are we are we spreading on this that we're going into because if, if we just kind of occasionally uh, like occasionally meeting up, occasionally meeting up when everyone kind of oh you hear about me up here and there, it's kind of at risk of getting a bit sort of just burn out a little bit because or we get a bit sort of a bit apathetic towards it or suddenly you know, we live in such a um, such a materialistic world that other things that spark new things that take your yeah vision, but we have actual step-by-step -step real sort of, okay, meet up six months of time, how's everyone getting on, where, where, where are we? That, I think that's a really good, really good thing to do. Um, definitely put around an email list and, and get the group sign up and you know, meet up for a moment to discuss if you're interested in how we take it forward. And there is a group, an Oxford Democracy group, I mean I'm calling it that, it's a group, the Democracy Action on the Working Group. Dog. D-A-W-G. Dog.
No, exactly. But we can have one of the targets it does take off. Um, would be one, you know, one of the, the many groups feeding into it. Um, when we say affordability, that appears to mean to replicate structures working with detail and all the existing kind of urban organisation like we can have, which is meant to be a hub for diverse uh, groups of people working on these issues. Do they already meet that monthly? Can they, and then infrastructure in place, and kind of email contacts and so on? We, you that again, you've got different organisations doing similar things. So it's kind of the answer to the question. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. There's a few individuals who do it. Like right. Yeah. Yeah. Mumble.
inspiring thing. The, the question is whether it can, you know, has a means to really sort of force itself into onto mainstream agenda. I think it's very exciting. I think I think she meant People's Assembly Network, not People's yeah. Assembly Against Austerity. <laughs> it's two. Yeah, I meant network. I mean, I'm quite a few in different cities around the country now. Yeah. So no, it's the same thing. No, no, there's a People's Assembly, um, People's Assembly network, which has been going on for a while now. People's Assembly against austerities oh, just started back in June. Oh, uh, which one is the network, but it's fine. Yeah, okay. There was a point over there. Well, I think that fragmentation is actually one of the problems. Yeah. And the fact that there, there is no vacuum. Every local, every city has got a lot of activists yeah. doing, going to a lot of meetings. Yeah. And to try and create something new runs the risk. And frankly, a lot of, several of the people's assemblies I've visited, it's been the same, to be blunt, elderly Trotskyites <laughs> um, mm. who are, you know, who are piling in. And in some cases, the younger, keener people who are coming along are actually being slightly alienated by hearing the same old arguments. The question is, if there is, as we believe, an upsurge of people who are really worried now about inequality and unfairness and injustice, um, we need some new strategies. And actually, I mean, I'd be great to talk about mentoring, older people mentoring, but frankly, a lot of the older people need to get out of the way. And mm -hmm. I speak as one. Um, you know, there are, we actually need to create the spaces where people can build their skills, build their, you know, build their experience without necessarily rehashing what has been done but already, because a lot of it hasn't worked very well. I think that uh, what uh, you had the TTIP in uh, sorry the TPP in Mexico has got, got what 65,000 people. Uh, this one in this country, I mean, on the 15th of May, there's actually a European uh, wide <laughs> uh, protest against the TTIP, but uh, there isn't one in London, uh, <laughs> which is quite really sad. But unfortunately, that actually happens. Although what you find is actually uh, like the PAAA, People's Assembly Against Austerity, I did find actually there's a, a number of uh, people who are in unions and uh, 
uh, political parties actually are participating in that, while the uh, like people like uh, groups like Occupy uh, end up with maybe yeah Green Party me Green Party members, the younger ones, and the um, hippies and the anarchists really. So that's just interesting. There's no actual platform, I don't know if we're kind of caught up with democracy, I mean, there's no actual platform for us realistically to be able to openly, massively debate policy properly, and actually for us all to kind of have a massive, like a massive voice that, that really gets listened to, and actually, I mean, I mean we, there is, like, we also need to talk about it, rarely does it get a movement, and I, I think we, we need some sort of website or that, or that has, like, that the kind of people can almost vote and uh, have a vote for and say, look, okay, this is the policy that I think. Almost like a, not like a referendum for every single thing, but just so like everyone has their voice heard. And I think that, that could kind of tie in quite nicely with kind of like a, a movement that we're all covering together. It means that we can all sort of propose our ideas together and actually just like, sort of get a collective ethos essentially together with how we kind of think things can change in the right way. Right, resources is really important because every community is going to have their own specific issues based on their region and their city and their country. So th there are going to be things that are specific and different, but again, we're fighting with the same beast. Yeah. So maybe it's just like to have a place, again, where there's resources there where people can go to that will, like if they don't know the legal kind of issues that they're dealing with, where they can go and find out specifically what's going on in their city, country, state, whatever it is. Yeah. You know, because I, I don't know if debating policy would just be another way to kind of slow things down <coughs> rather than just giving people a resource center where they can also communicate with one another and share best practice, but not necessarily vote on things. Because that's when you get where it just takes ages and people argue. And we have to have shared objectives, though. Hmm? We have to have shared objectives. Well, there is a shared objective, but every locality is going to have very specific issues. You know, and it's, it's getting all of those localities together in one place where, yes, the, the legal systems might be different, but ultimately we're fighting the same beast. And to, to exchange, again, exchange best practice, exchange stories. I mean, storytelling is really, really important. It, it breeds empathy. You know, it's like in the States, in Washington, we have the Cowboy and Indian Alliance, which is quite cheeky for wordplay, but it's actually yeah. Native <laughs> people. So we're historically, obviously, not only so they talk together, but, you know, they're, they're enemies, you know, but because now you have the ranchers having similar problems to the native people that they've had for hundreds of years, they're linking up, mm -hmm. you know, and in, in Alaska, it was probably the guy I'm working with, the, the, um, the copper and gold mine, the reason that they're going to win there is because they've linked up with commercial fishermen, because it's going to threaten the salmon industry. So it's, you know, it's, it's people that wouldn't necessarily normally work together, but they come together under these issues. And honestly, that's how they're going to stop that mine, because it's going to threaten 15,000 jobs with the salmon fishery. But by protecting that, they're also protecting indigenous land. It's my job to tell you all, but it's my quarter to five or quarter to six. Mm, this is it's getting good. <laughs> <laughs>
Spain. No, we're looking at uh, we're looking at Spain. Informational leverage. I think I think that's the real struggle. It's how you get in in a world where the media is more and more controlled. Mm-hmm. How you turn these yeah. amazing things that are already happening into something that actually forces itself into the mainstream story of what what's really going on. Like Occupy. Um, yeah, okay. I mean that's that's why in a sense Occupy is for me of the main sort of organisations I'm involved seems to be the the one that it would make sense to to centre around because it did have that verbal. And, and, and basically the idea is, is sort of um, reverse engineering Occupy, like all the ways that the power system managed to sort of undermine it and prevent it from going, from, from being a sort of conversation changing movement to a really you know, world changing movement to try and bring together all those things that it couldn't do. Like I actually have the alternative, bring together the alternative that so much work has already been done on, on bringing, you know, on, on thinking through and working out. Mm-hmm. And you know, most of these things are happening somewhere. Actually, mm-hmm. the, 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 the good thing about well, the movement to really come together. Um, so what, even if that's not guaranteed that that will happen, but oh, I mean, hopefully it will. Um, but one way of doing it is just to, to join and be aware of, and of all as many groups as possible, just to really keep an eye out for jo- groups that follow your ethos and actually join in with it. I mean, on my invitation, you can do it. Well, you can find a coach and take all the rest. Okay. Uh, I'm turning this off.